my little one. Where have you gone, my modest son? These lines began the first poem in a series of 15 which were published in Poetry Picnic in 2011 over the course of that year. So I've gathered the 15 together here and thought I would read them and I call it Picnic. My little one, where have you gone, my little one? Where have you gone, my modest son? When you were small, the most tiny known, now I peek around. Where have you gone? Once your fingers were pickles, and so were your toes. You once had minute freckles on the bridge of your nose. But you kept growing out of your clothes, a diaper, a shirt, some hose. God, how you could grow. Where did you go? That poem was written in 1965. As I said, it got published in uh, Poetry Picnic in 2011. So you never give up on these things. Sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. This is another, this one was written in 1969, and again, published in 2011. Kisses. Kisses are the blossoms fallen to the river, touching with calm softness, yet strong as the tide can make them, rippling in the currents of the rushing river. They are mine forever, taken from their giver, smooth to worldly roughness, placid on the stormy lake, then floating like a flower on a rushing river. Kisses are the breezes blowing on the river, brimming with refreshness, touching early evening darkness, given unto blossom these blooms of the giver. Kisses are the blossoms fallen from the giver, pressing gentle softness on the lips pursuing to take them, burning on the surface of my rushing river. Ode to my grandmother, June 11, 1974. Dedicated to Esther Wilson Brown, 1899-1986. She taught me reading of words upon her knee at 420 and 4 Washington Ave. In the kitchen, she made crust pies for me. I've never had better than those I'd have. You know, in 1899, this country was a dissimilar place lacking conveniences from in our time. Automobile excursion, not outer space. Stores were not all states were not all states. Borders not yet strung. Through history she stayed forever young. When somebody has been there all your life, they can simply be taken for granted. Through the moments of joy, hard times and strife, she was there with love given open handed. It's art to be a grandmother. Science, too. Some are artisans. Mine was a master. How can you show what someone means to you? Carve their statue in white alabaster? I count it a blessing I'm her grandson. I'll survey her and stay for y forever young. 11th June, 1974. Happy birthday, ma'am, ma'am, at 75. You gave the future to me and much more. You made the past glow vivid and alive. Today everybody sings you a song. I want you to know in my heart will sing every visit where you took me along, every story told, every toy you would bring, and this peon will forever be sung for being so hip and forever young. <clears throat> okay, this is a long poem. They originally intended to be quite a bit longer, but I only wrote this uh, first part of it. Poem Symphonic First Movement Sonata Allegro The face I saw when fool went her ago, still today still haunts the air of spring and fall. A wind image of frost, of ice, of snow, the rustling summer trees hearken the call. Her name escapes my off fragile tongue. My thoughts go back to fine Decembering. 
I knew only the girl was froth the young. That blur is all that comes remembering. The rest goes hastingly away again, like melting snow in March that greets the spring. The memory melts to torrents of rain. It washes wild and floods everything in spring before the blossom buds can break. The empty fields so barren, bleak they ache. The face I saw one fall winter ago is blown icy with time's blue, pale, cool breath. And once this soul floated high to and fro, then winter came full blast, the depth of death had come. In February she left. I wail silent for fading memory to bring some lingering image to me. Face a past winter, I know you, don't I? Haunt of spring, of air, and memory still. Will the snow and ice again bring you by? Must I live as best can be until time turns me to rusting brittlely too? Decembering must I go always more, seeking images of fading fog blue, frothy youth I knew in days long before. Time was when I could have known so well this lost image, but carelessly she escaped. Love was brief. A candle flame and quick kiss. Blossom buds may break in spring before long. Birds may come home. Hear me, share in my song. The buds may soon break. The face I saw last winter will be in bird song. Winter is the season of loss. Feel it seventy-seven times greater. Blue windy moods, white empty snows, each a dawn of emotional weather. The face that I knew last winter is in the ashes beneath the logs. It is in the smoke and splinters. It is in the ember glow that is gone. All faces, like the fireplace flames, are fragile, made of burning features that cannot be constructed the same way out of the cinders. The face I knew last winter, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. But she is not dead as cinders. The face is just far from us. There must not be emotion. It must be told from reason, calm, with no quaking voice, all in order in its season. If my voice shakes at the end, it is only that I am tired. It has not been my choice that I tell the tale again. <clears throat> Death comes for my great-great-grandmother. Seldom our lot so unwilling to part our friend. The fell destroyer laying his cold hand upon her, claimed her as his own. A few days ago we saw her in bloom in the activity of life in the center of the circle, radiating joy and happiness, now cold in the embrace of death. But to her the grave no terror. She stood upon the confines of eternity beautiful angels to bear her away, anxious to quit this world of fleeting joys and dwell forever with her Lord. In early life, the necessity of heart change, an interest in merits of atonement, count of distance, a greater field of usefulness, a double concentration to Christ and to his cause. But her warfare destined to be short in the midst of her labors before that objective accomplished. The subject of so many prayers, with hope guardian angels watch over her motherless children. She closed her eyes to death. She lived a life of faith, prayer, and her Bible, her daily companion. Look upon its well-worn pages, the deeply impressed love of God's truth. A lamp shining continually on her way, and never did her feet stray from its blessed path of light. Kindness and hospitality unwearied diligence as head of family, unselfish devotion, a character of unusual generosity, self-denial, and self-sacrifice. Not in herself was her trust, in Jesus alone it was placed, clothed with his righteousness, saved by his grace, she rests in peace. Her record is on high, and she entered her mansion in the skies, a saint of light. 
And if an inheritance choose I might to carry in my genes, I'd just sooner have it be the spirit of Susan Russell Bruner. On the seventh, God and poet rested, a Shadorma. Let light be, heaven from the sea, land, sea, tree, luminary, all living creatures creepy, and then there came we. You can look it up in Genesis. Natural disasters snowed under. It snowed today. It snowed yesterday. It snowed the other day. It snowed a lot. Where does it all come from? We are completely snowed under. It's piled high along the shed, here, there, and asunder. Where does it all come from? I'm pondering back to my youth. We had snow days aplenty, but to ask in all truth, where does it all come from? This ignoble pile up of trash, snowed under barrels and bags, a terrible big stash. Where does it all come from? These leavings of dinners and life, papers, plastics, empty tins. Our wastefulness is rife. Trash day today. They miss now four. It's snowing again. We're buried for sure. That poem and the next were both written in 2010 during the uh, blizzards we had here. That requited love has limits. Pale white winter spread about like a dead love grown cold. All the beauty first eyed was froze with ice in a hallmark scene grown old. When began this love affair, so light and fresh and new, we felt embraced and blessed by nature's kiss. Our exhilaration grew. But this trice now long exposed is unwelcome in our arms. Yet it remains to chill and haunt our steps with its long icicle charms. Pale white winter still remains like a cold love long dead, whose memory won't melt to let us seek spring's florid breast instead. Walking. I used to be a wanderer. There was freedom in my feet. I walked the ground of wilderness, froze by the winter frost, or muddied by the overspill from everlasting springtime rain. I trudged through broken cities over glass and cast-off souls, between the monuments of men who slaved in high-rise towers and thought that they were kings. Up stepped between the raindrops amid a thousand falling tears that washed these allegoric alleys across the literature of years. Up crossed those dreamscape boulevards full of screaming, streaming cars, as well as dusty wagon ruts of someone's long forsaken field. I've hiked the trails of history, the craters, heights, and dates, until I walked out of the past and became a part of it. You walk this earth for long enough, it starts to wear you down. Little pings and twinges like wars and dirty deeds sapped away enthusiasm from man's material mind and call you to a higher plane where I'll go a-wandering. In my villanelle I think I am the villain in my villanelle. I wish I could break out and be free form instead but I'd rather stay the rules than language in hell. Of course I want to do my own thing and rebel, not count the syllables, my rhythm, or my rhyme. I think I am the villa, villain in my villanelle. What if I change the pattern, ramble to spell? Is anybody counting? Is it such a crime? But I'd rather stay the rules than language in hell. Over the corpse of rhythm, some have rung the knell. Though it's easier, I'll not lie in that bed. I think I am the villain in my villanelle because I chafe again what others do compel, and ran of how I suffer to compose each line, but I'd rather stay the rules than language in hell. So it is the fate of man since Eve and Adam fell, 
the struggle with obedience till we drop dead. I think I am the villain in my villanelle, but I'd rather stay the rules than language in hell. Okay, ooh, Tamashi, you know, restored. Okay, now this consists of a sonnet as the strophe, a royal, a rhyme royal as the any strophe, and a shadorma as the ephod. And it's about Masio, December 21st, 1401, to all, until we died in August of 1428, was born to Mas. Di Sir Giovante di Simone. His pen name means big, fat, messy, or clumsy Tom. Now, this, this, this poem concerns a painting that he did called The Expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden in 1425. It was part of a larger work when the uh, Braccasio Chapel in Florence and that particular panel was many years later censored by someone painting fig leaves over the privates of Adam and Eve. That bicker, fat or messy, clumsy Tom Masasio, the painting master realistically portraying God's kingdom on canvas framed and on walls of plaster. Upon the latter such, he did receive censor by prudes who blushed and brushed his lines with fig leaves put across Adam and Eve. All do they hide as their own impure minds. This artist deserves much more man's respect. Though died so young, he gave such influence to those who followed his point of perspective, the vanishing point for evidence. It is not the nudity that's evil, it's the censorship plays the devil. There are those delicate souls of less wit who take offense at innocence and truth, fearful of natural depiction. It drives them to destruction with oh such ruthlessness, they hide from us the whole, forsooth these many generations, until some brave soul restored it to what the artist gave. We perceive Adam as he was, and so does woman Eve. Thus not shame by nudity, shame by sin they be. Old Billy. Hay bales, out in a field alone. Strange forms out of season, capped with snow and withering in the winds. The farmer lived long and alone after Lizzie died that spring a ways. A man with outsized hands and sinewy arms who spoke in long silences. Window shades in the old house pull well down against the light. Inside the shadows, the cobwebs mingle like lovers. Barn roof sagging against the weight of age and the weather. Silo boards rotting. Only the odor lingers in the barn. The bales curled in fetal rolls across the neglected landscape. Just a reminder that at the auction no one wanted the hay. Beware of the blog. In the dark, sticky recesses of our only such repertory, in the flicker of the screen and the screams of some girls who sat not silent beyond, I, in other fascination, watched the universal uglies. The makeup formed fantasies on the faces of Bella, Boris, and Lon. But in the lonely, looming dimness of my bedroom in the midnight minutes, I cringed in fear and loathing, reliving mummy, monster, bat, and beast. Would a vampire wing in through my window? Would the mummy unravel my restraints? Would, a oh horror of it all, Frankenstein's creature crash my hall, smash through my confines and drown me in the sink like the flower and the child? I had a few defenses against these imaginings of mine. What did they have in common that could provide me escapes? Slowness of step and ungainly gates. 
why the mummy moved like the molasses, and the monster stumbled on outside shoes. I could outrun both as if they walked in glue. Oh yes, the wolfman was quick, but restrained by the moon, and you get enough garlic and the ghastly Dracula will fall into a swoon. Besides, I reasoned, in my bed in my room, I dwelt safely in the center of the streets of our tiny, tidy town. By the time these hobbled horrors hopped from the gloom, they would have satiated appetites and want no more of eats. So safe in bed I'm found. And until the blob glides across the floor, right through the door, and all around the wall. Not only would nothing stop it, as it slid in through some crack, it was never satisfied, eating its never-ending snack, as it creeps, as it leaps, to a tune by Bacharach. The Blob starred Steve McQueen. The one starring Steve McQueen came out in 1958. It was made by Valley Forge Films, which normally made religious movies. I saw The Blob on its first run at the Colonial Theater in Phoenixville. A somewhat bizarre situation. Watching a monster in a film eat the theater you were watching the film in. It's 2.15. Moza fed the theater and then ran to the diner. Must have quite athlete, been quite athletic. The theater is in Phoenixville and the diner is in Downingtown, around 16 miles apart. I have also eaten in that diner. In the scene from the film I have, I am showing here, also has some meaning to me. The fireman dressed in white is Tom Ogden. More correctly, Reverend Tom, Thomas Ogden, who was my minister when I attended the Downingtown Methodist Church as a boy. He played the fire chief in the film. Cycles. Grrm, grrm, goes some Harley down the street. Never had a motor. Had a playing card in the spokes, and that sounded neat. Like a putt, putt, putt. And had a siren. Oh, it was loud and illegal, probably. But my grandfather found it, bought it, got it somewhere. And it was a police bike siren from the 1800s, recycled on a Schwinn, and it really did squeal. But that was long ago, back in my childhood. How the years cycle by like flip cards in a peep show Nickelodeon. I can see us as scrawny little urchins, Plopping coins saved from gathering pop bottles off the street to recycle at the grocers. Buying us some cream sipples and fudge pops out of a core inside an Atlantic gas station. Or was it S.O. then? A lot of things are gone that'll never cycle back. Sinatra sang of cycles, but old Blue Eyes is a long time dead. The seasons come and Seasons go, and we watch the bloom and blossom, and the frosting on the pumpkin, and the falling leaf and snow, the ever-churning cha changes of the same old, same old cycles. Life is like a washer, so much on automatic. We're awash in wishes as we spin our way through time. Then a rattle and a clatter, our cycle out of balance, reminds us that our dreams have changed from grandiose to mundane. And now we only recycle memories. Late that morning, she picked up the tray and carried it, breakfast time now well gone, to the kitchen from the bed. She scraped the plate with the clean fork and left all in the sink while she made a brief, brief call. Walking down her lovely garden path, she sat in the dirt in dressing gown to snip some flowers growing there. In the distance, the foam had rung, but this task was enough for now. They would too soon be here. She heard them come. She heard them go. She didn't know just where she stood, dizzy in the world the last day, holding gladiolas in her hand, thinking she should make lunch, perhaps. But at the stroke of one, the tears broke. That was Picnic. Thank you.